gardens and the parks in the countryside of England are painted throughout the spring and summer with the colours of her trees and flowers. The solemn, cool and restful greens and browns of the trees. And the gayer pinks and blues of the flowers. The leader of the unindustrious butterfly and the workshop of that self-conscious model of into the busy bee. But it is the colour which is so much part of our countryside, which is reflected in all our trades and crafts, most of all in the art and science of pottery. The decoration of pottery has always found its inspiration in flowers. All that beauty springs from the common clay, but how does it attain that shape? Follow it back to the source, where as a shapeless mass it is cleaned and prepared and made ready for the hand of the potter. It's still the hand of the potter, though today there's a good deal of machinery in the craft. It's a skilled job throwing the flattened clay onto the centre of the mould, although the expert makes it look simple. He's making plates, and plates are shaped from the outside. All along the line, they're making plates for the English potter supplies the needs of the world at large. Look over there, you'll see girls making cups. Cups are shaped from within, otherwise there's not a lot of difference. After all, a cup is really only a small plate with its colour up. When it's dry, the cup is removed from the mould and it is then ready to have the handle stuck on handles themselves are coming out of a separate mould. Isn't it nice to see a girl putting handles on cups instead of knocking them off? This design in relief which is going on now is centuries old but it's still very attractive. Which do you prefer? Coffee? Or tea? There's a third method of giving shape to a chunk of wet clay, and that's called throwing. It's the oldest method of all, and it still depends entirely on the skill in the hands of the potter. The only modern touch about it is the driving of the wheel by electricity. Incidentally, this is just about the point at which we ought to be quoting a piece of Omar Khayyam, but everybody knows it, so we won't. Surely this is one of the most fascinating trades at which a man can earn his living, and it's a trade in which England has always excelled. These men are artists. Their work is brilliant. Apart from that, it must be very satisfying to make something really beautiful out of a piece of sloppy mess, like building a mink coat out of a wet Macintosh. This is the turner's lathe, one stage nearer the finished article since it left the thrower. In this job, as in almost everything else from driving a car to making love, it's important to know when to stop. Hang on a bit too long and you turn a beautiful teapot lid into a soap dish. Yet another method is casting. That's the time-honoured way of setting liquid into a shape used for anything from a railway wheel to a blancmange. In this case, it's a cover dish. And when it comes out of the mould after having set, it's all complete, even to the handle. Sauces, plates, bowls, mugs, dishes, the whole range of pottery is ready for the fire. In the case of plates, they're placed between layers of sand to keep each one true in shape. This is another stage at which science has been called to the aid of art. The electrically fired tunnel oven saves time and the temperature can be kept in perfect control. The temperature in the oven is approximately 1145 degrees centigrade. Imagine the heat the cook must get in the oven at home when she brings out a plate all covered with little brown veins like a leaf in autumn. Presumably the answer is the cook has no control. This is the control panel, a 
careful check is kept on the heat in every section of the oven. What a contrast this is to the sooty bottle oven which for so long has been a characteristic shape up in the potteries. Let's get back quick to the shiny modern one. The opposite end where they all come out telling each other they've been through hell. How do they get that shine on their faces? It's the glazing process. A simple dip in the glaze and then being set up to dry. You can tell by the professional twist of the wrist that the man who's doing it is an expert. Even if you couldn't see by his cap that he's in the first eleven. Glaze can also be applied by aerograph. Blowing on the shiny surface. And then they're all ready for the second firing. Placed so that only a tiny point is touching them. Modern pottery, like most of the best of modern things, has a keynote of simplicity. Plain colours and pastel shades are always pleasing and somehow soothing. But there's still a demand for attractive patterns, and the decorations are added by transfers. Dye is rubbed into an engraving and printed on thin, moist paper. Mind you, don't tear it. An alternative method is roller printing from an engraved cylinder. It's much faster and comes out on mass production lines. Isn't it marvellous the way he handles it without tearing it? Look at the way some people make a mess of the Sunday newspaper. But where are these decorations created? Here in the design department is an artist evolving a new pattern. This particular one is going to the Americas. Most countries have a distinct and individual taste in pottery. And of course, you have to be careful that the squiggles you put on don't have alphabetical characters which mean something. You mustn't draw a little Chinese house and find out too late that it's a Chinese word for something rude. Back again to the transfers. They're all inspected before being put into use. Good printing. Good design. Goodbye. After that, they're cut out and placed on the cup or the plate or whatever it may be and rubbed in. That little piece of paper is having a tough time, but its sufferings are nearly at an end. After this, it gets itself washed off, leaving the printed outline as a guide for enamelling. Decorations can be put on either under the glaze or over it, but perhaps the best of all is freehand painting. Smashing one of these is just one more way of breaking some girl's heart. This, then, is the story of modern pottery. How art combines with science. How the ancient skill of forgotten centuries finds its reincarnation in the brain and fingers of craftsmen of the 20th century. Serving to make the home more beautiful. Or, at any rate, more unusual. The pieces are finished. The potter's work is done. There is no limit to the variety of pattern and form in his work. Its usefulness and its beauty we can leave to speak for themselves. Don't forget what inspired it all. The flowers on the countryside of England. Nature's exquisite textbook for the designers of English pottery. This is the glory of the colour that is known the world over. Part of the glory that is England. The delicate, ethereal children of such a sturdy old soul as Mother Earth. Colour in clay.
It's a skilled job, throwing the flattened clay onto the center of the mold, although the expert makes it look simple. He's making plates. leader of the unindustrious butterfly and the workshop of that self-conscious model of into the busy bee. But it is the colour which is so much part of our countryside, which is reflected in all our trades and crafts, most of all in the art and science of pottery. The decoration of pottery has always found its inspiration in flowers. All that beauty springs from the common clay, but how does it attain that shape? Follow it back to the source, where as a shapeless mass it is cleaned and prepared and made ready for the hand of the potter. It's still the hand of the potter, though today there's a good deal of machinery in the craft. The gardens and the parks and the countryside of England are painted throughout the spring and summer with the colours of her trees and flowers. The solemn, cool and restful greens and browns of the trees. and the gayer pinks and blues